So we're going to talk today about Psalm chapter 6. So I know you have your Bible, so please turn there. And I'm excited about this passage because I'll be honest with you, um, this passage has challenged me this week in many ways. And I pray it's a blessing to you as it's been to me. And I want to set the stage because we talked about for this last week, this week and the week um, coming up, we're going to be just looking at a couple psalms. And as I always try to do is I try to put it into context, not just what the psalm is about, but why it's valuable for your life. And I mentioned uh, last week that there's three reasons why you should be studying the psalms. The first reason that it's designed to elevate our praise and worship of God. In fact, the very word psalms mean praises. So as we're up here singing with the worship team, the purpose of psalms is helping us to go into a deeper understanding of why and how we go about worshiping God. We talked about how the psalms have value in the fact that they inspire hope and faith in difficult times. Because as we're going to see in the psalm today, the psalms address real-life situations. And as they address real-life situations, they express true emotion to God about those situations. And the third thing, it enhances our understanding of the New Testament. I mentioned last week that the Psalms is one of the most cited Old Testament books in the entire New Testament. Scholars say there's about 400, at least 400 references to the Psalms in the New Testament. And we all know that we like the New Testament, but we cannot appreciate the New Testament without going back and understanding the Old Testament. And here in this Psalm, we're going to look at a Psalm which was written by King David. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with King David, but I want to provide a profile of who he is. Because I believe that when you understand David's life, and you understand what David is saying in Psalm 6, is going to make that much more significance about what's going on. And I want to share this quick slide up here. This is a, a picture of, well, obviously not David, but it's a picture supposedly depicting David. But more importantly, there's a picture of a stone slab up there. Now why would I show that? Because for many years... Scholars have said the story of David is a fictional story. It's not historically accurate, but they found this stone slab, and on this stone slab was referring to a nation that had gone into battle with Israel. They reference, and on the inscription, House of David. And I thought of this, and I want to put it up there, because just this week, one of my children had one of the professors say, I just want you to know that the Bible was not full of history. And you guys know how much I love apologetics. And so as we're laying out this story, we're talking about historical reality. That archaeologists have said there is a person called David. And no matter what the world may say to try to divert us from our faith, we recognize that we believe in a reasonable faith. A faith that does have confirmation, not a blind leap into the dark. So let's talk about David. What do we know about this young man? Well, first of all, he was a shepherd boy. He was a talented musician who played the harp. You guys remember, he would go before King Saul and play. And then he would eventually become probably Israel's most famous king. And when you read about David's life, we all talk about the successes and triumphs of his life, right? The story that I remember as a young kid, maybe you remember as well, is David defeats Goliath, this giant, right, in 1 Psalm 17. And that's just a reflection because throughout David's life, he had many military campaigns that he was very successful on. And so for us, we often look and say, wow, David was a man of great success, great triumph. But you know what David's life was also marred by? By tragedy and failure. And I want you to understand this because it's going to shape the context of what's going on in Psalm chapter 6. And just to lay it out, David is anointed the next king by the prophet Samuel. And the whole time that David's waiting to become king, what does the, what does the previous or the, the current king Saul do? He tries to kill David. You might think, well, I can understand that, but you know what? David remained loyal to Saul to the day that he died. And I'm looking out there, and I can imagine, like David, you have been loyal to someone who has stabbed you in the back, who has hurt you, and that's exactly what David went through. But beyond that, David was a man who had moral failure. And as we know, probably the greatest moral failure that he's had was when he um, had relations with another man's wife, and then after that, he actually ordered the murder of her husband. And the consequences of that moral failure in his life were devastating to his family. One of his children die. There's constant friction among his children and to the point where one of his sons actually tries to murder him and take away his throne. So the reality is that we see in David's life the power of God's forgiveness, but forgiveness doesn't always remove the consequences of our sin. We need to keep that in mind. But what's powerful is here's David just like us. We can relate to David and these contrasting experiences, right? And what David does is he goes through them. He goes before God and begins to pour out his heart as he goes through these 
Good moments and bad moments of life. And as we approach Psalm 6, this is David going through a trial in life. We don't know exactly what the trial is, but we see a man who, by the way, God refers to him as a man after my own heart, where David says, as a man after my own heart, I'm going to go to God in my pain and, and bring it to him. And so one of my challenges for you guys is to think about your own situation and say, how can I look to David's life in my own pain and find a way to go through it? Because I know right now, you guys have either experienced pain or you're going through it right now. I often find myself, and I don't know if it's the Lord intentionally does it, but as you're preparing for a sermon, the sermon becomes real in your own life throughout that week. This week was a reminder about the trials and difficulties of life, and I'll just share a few examples of this, and my life is no different than yours. You can come up here and share what you're going through. We found out that my daughter has to get another ankle surgery, and many of you guys know this is a multiple surgeries. A family member of mine was diagnosed with invasive cancer. I talked with a gentleman on the phone the other day, and he said, BJ, please pray for me. It has been for a year that I'm dealing with chronic illness, and the doctors don't know what's going on. I met with a gentleman earlier this week whose son was killed this past year. Then I got a phone call from a friend of mine who let me know that his father had passed away. The reality of life is full of difficulties and trials. And I believe that what we're going to see in David is we're going to see a man who says, let me show you how to walk through this trial and difficulty by taking your burden to the Lord. Now I want you to understand before we begin to unpack Psalm chapter 6, David has an intimate relationship with God. Oftentimes when the, when the trial or tragedy comes, that's the moment where we want to get close to God, right? And then we sit there and say, God, why don't, why don't you hear me? But David recognized that it wasn't the key of getting close to God during the trial, it was before the trial. And so what you see coming off of his lips in this powerful psalm is this intimate relationship that he already had with God. And so I can't give you a lot of advice if you want to mimic David's life besides the fact that you need to become intimate with him. Because when David went to God, he did not go to the, some distant being. He went like a child to his father and said, God, Father, here is my heart. I need you right now. And it's in that context where we see the power of what's going on in this psalm. And I pray it's rejuvenating to you, and it transforms the way that you see your relationship with, uh, with God, and it transforms the way that you approach Him when you're going through difficult times. So let's unpack Psalm chapter 6. This is what it starts off with. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, and deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. And I don't know about you guys, but just reading that reminds me the power of what we need to hear today. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray our hearts and minds are open because we're going to find in David a powerful way to approach you as our Father when we're going through difficult times in life. And I pray, God, besides just finding healing with whatever we're experiencing right now, it'll transform the way that we see you and how we approach you. And ask this on your son's precious name, Jesus. Amen. So let's look at this. The first thing that David recognizes in this psalm is his dependence upon God's mercy. In fact, he opens up this prayer, this, uh, this psalm before the Lord. He says, O Lord, in verse 1, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. See, the very first thing David does, he goes before God and he says, look it, I acknowledge there may be, there's some wrongdoing. There's some offense that I have. And really, scholars said we don't really know the exact situations David's going through. So it could be either David saying he's acknowledging or David saying, God, I recognize there's something that has hindered me in my walk with you. So he goes before God and he recognizes that. Not only does he recognize that, what does he say? He understands that he could possibly be under God's correction. 
And so you look at that verse and you probably, like me, the very first thing I'm, I'm, I asked myself, and hopefully you asked the same question, did David really feel that God was angry with him and that he was under his wrath? Or as some dis, um, translations say, hot displeasure. Well, there's a variety of different views on this, and the first thing I think we could say is that David didn't want to be under his anger or wrath. And I'm sure you guys feel the same way. But my personal opinion is I feel that what David is doing is he's just being honest, expressing how he felt at that moment. For whatever reason, he feels like he is under God's anger or displeasure as he's going through this trial and this challenge. And isn't that kind of a similar response to how we have? We're going through a difficulty, we're facing a trial. When things in our life are not going well, it's often our response to say, God, you've got to be angry with me. God, you must, be dis you must not be pleased with me. And in fact, what do we do when we see other people going through trials, going through difficult times? Often we step back and say, ooh, I'm glad I'm not them. God really ain't happy with them, right? Probably better English, hopefully, than mine. But we've got to remember this key point. Because whether David's just expressing his heart or saying, God, I don't want to get to that stage where I'm under your wrath, there's a powerful truth that even David didn't fully grasp that we have right now. Because David was before the cross, we're after the cross. So listen to this. If you are a follower of Christ, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you may experience his rebuke and discipline. But one thing is this, you will not be an object of his anger or his wrath. I want to read this powerful verse right here. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, and Paul is speaking to the church at Thessalonica. He says, For God has not destined or appointed us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this is the first thing you have to grasp in what David's going before God, is that we have to understand that if we are believers, then the wrath that God had towards us has been paid at the cross. That no longer when I go before God do I have to feel His anger and His wrath. And we'll talk about his discipline, but I'm hoping right now that that transforms the way you see God and the way that you see your relationship with God. Because when we face difficulties, even ones that we have brought on ourselves, right? And we all can start thinking about things this week that we did, that it's like, God, I know I didn't live up to the way you want me to. The power that you must have recognized is that we are not object of God's anger or his wrath. And I hope that you grasp that point because it should transform right now how you see God in the situation that you're in. Now, like I said, while we're not obvious of God's wrath, David did acknowledge God's discipline, didn't he? He sensed in his life that there was some correction that God was bringing in. And I'm going to tell you something. If you can be honest with yourself, and I'll be honest with you, I have experienced God's discipline in my life. And discipline is not usually seen as a positive thing, right? I mean, who likes to be disciplined? Because we often see discipline as an action of a controlling or authoritative parent, some adult in our life, some boss that we have to work through. Who are they to tell me how to live my life? Isn't it my choice to be able to go off and do what I want, have fun and enjoy my life? Why does this person think they control me? And so we often look at discipline in a negative way, but I want you to transform the way you see God's discipline. Because that's not how God disciplines us, to control us. God's discipline is rooted out of a corrective love of a father. Do you hear what I said? It's a corrective love. God says, I'm going to discipline you for a purpose, and that's to divert you away from a destructive path. And if you were here last week, or go ahead and listen to it online, we talked about the path of the wicked, didn't we? And that's what God is saying. He's saying, look, I see that where you're at, and I know that my discipline has to come in to divert you back to where you need to be. I love what it says in Proverbs 3. This is verse 11 and 12. It said, my child... Don't reject the Lord's discipline. Don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Revelation 3.19, which we dealt with a few weeks ago, right? This is the letter to the church at Laodicea, which we know was not a very good church. No positive things God said, could say about that church. But yet, in Jesus' personal letter to that church, he ends with, Those whom I love... I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. So I'm going to say something radical to you all. The next time you experience God's discipline in your life, rejoice. Because I'll say this, it is a sign of God's love for you as his child. But as much as I tell you rejoice, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. God's discipline is not an easy process. Because as you go through it, man... And God goes through that refining process in your life. It can be extremely difficult. 
In fact, we're going to look in the life of David and see how intense God's discipline was in his own situation. But I'll tell you, it was necessary in David's life and it is necessary in our life because if we walk away from the Lord, one of the greatest ways that God can bring us back is his corrective discipline. The author of Hebrews points it this way. This is uh, Hebrews 12, 11. It says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than ple- uh, pleasant, right? You got your parents. I got some young kids out there. My dad and my mom, they, before they correct me, say, I love you, and this is going to hurt me more than you. Yeah, we understand that. <laughs> yeah. But, that, but look, it. this is what it says. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So the purpose of why he's disciplining, God's saying, is to bring fruit out of your life, to draw you closer to me. And that word trained by it, it is almost like an athlete training for a competition, right? What it means is that if you have an attitude like David did in this situation, you are going to yield and embrace what God is doing through your life in the midst of that discipline. Because I've said it before, I have learned more about myself and my relationship with God through difficult times and through times of discipline. It is difficult to go through it, but I would not be who I am in my walk with Christ without embracing those moments because what's going to happen, like David, God's going to bring his discipline and you start to correct you and you have to make a choice. Do I embrace what God is doing? Do I resist it and continue on the path that I am? And for David, we're going to see he was a man who says, God, I'm going to embrace your corrective discipline in my life. And we'll see why David could do that. And it's really one thing, it's his view of who God is, which we struggle, it seems like, today in the church. So after David talks about his wrongdoing, he acknowledges God's discipline, now he appeals to God's mercy. And this is verse 2 and 3. He says, Be gracious or merciful to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Literally, I'm weak. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? You know, one of the things when we fall short and we sin, what's the very first reaction that we want to have? We want to avoid God, don't we? The last thing, I mean, I'm telling you, there's times in my life where I know when I've sinned and I've gone against what God's called me to do, I struggle to go before him in prayer. It's that sense of guilt, that sense of shame, like how can I go before the Lord? And I'm hoping maybe a day or two, somehow that distance from that action will allow God, I'll find favor with him again. But do you see that's the exact opposite thing that David did? David had this this deep relationship with God and a powerful recognition of his mercy that he knew in his brokenness, he knew in his pain, he knew in his shortcomings that he could still approach God. And this is what David says in Psalm 86, 15, to to, uh, solidify that point. He says, but you, O Lord, you are a merciful and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You see, as he appeals to God's grace and mercy, David expresses his condition the following. So David understands, God, you are merciful. And even in my weakness, even in my shortcoming, I can still approach you. And as he approaches him, he's not going to be honest with God. He's going to say, God, this is how I feel. Now look, he's not being no drama queen or drama king in this case, right? He's not. He's coming before God and just saying, God, I'm going to be honest with how I feel. Now it's not like God didn't know what he was feeling, right? But it's for David in that intimate relationship to say, Father, this is how I feel right now. And so this is how David describes his situation. He goes, I am weak. That Hebrew word for weak is the imagery of a leaf or a plant that is withering, right? David's like, I'm literally withering right now, God. He goes, not only that, I'm troubled or terrified. That means he is facing such physical and spiritual distress that he feels terrified or overwhelmed. Then he uses these two powerful words, which I promise you, I have said in my life, and maybe you have said, How long? David isn't looking to God and saying, God, is it going to be another week? Is it going to be another month? It's not so much that David's waiting for a response about a certain time when it's going to end, but what David is letting God know in the death of his pain, I am worn out. I can't take anymore. I need you right now. It is a powerful expression of a man who knew his father in an intimate way. And so he goes before him and says, how long? And you can see in these words, he's, re- that he's, he's laying out the desperation of his situation that the only hope he can find is to rest in a gracious and merciful God. And I don't know about you, but there's many times I've said, God, how long? When we found out with my daughter's surgery, another one, what is this, five or six? We're like, how much longer, Lord? 
Because I think that David shows us that it is fine to be honest and genuine with him. God desires that from him, from us. And so after this very first thing, if David recognizes mercy, and I want to stop right there. Do you understand right now? I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what your pain, what your struggles are, whether you have brought them into your own life or somebody else has brought them into your life. You can approach your God for one reason, because he is merciful. Don't lose sight of that. Don't let the enemy rob you of the perspective from God's view of it that you can still approach him in his mercy. So after we recognize that, what is David's second point in this prayer? So I know God your mercy, but now he desires for God's deliverance. And this is what we see in verse 4 and 5. And here's verse 4. David says, Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. And there's two things we find here. First of all, David seeks a restoration with God. That word turn, I don't know what your translation says, but it literally means return. David felt some level of distance with God, and this became, listen, the most difficult part of his anguish. And all he wanted was, I want to be restored with you. You see, we're going through times right now, and, I, and I've found it as a, being in ministry, people come to me and they feel somewhat like David, but you know what they want? Before they want to be restored with God, they want everything else. I want my physical health back. I want this relationship restored. And I'm not saying that those are not important things to desire in your life, but listen, like David, when you're going through that moment, you feel that separation from God, if you need to have the heart like David and says, God, the most thing that I need right now is restoration with you. Because somehow we feel if we just have physical health, if all of our relationships are perfect, life's going to be perfect. But at the heart of what David recognized, these things are insignificant until I have my relationship with him restored. And then he realized the rest will take care of itself. So no matter what you're going through, let your heart be in the middle of that situation. Say, God, I just want restoration with you. I want to feel your presence in the midst of what I'm going through right now. And besides this desire for restoration, David recognized God's love. And I'm going to be honest with you. This was the most transforming part of this passage for me. Because while I grew up in a family where my parents talked about God's love, I'll tell you, even as a pastor, I have struggled sometimes to see how God can still love me for the things that I do. And here's what David says. He says, God, save me for the sake of your steadfast love. That steadfast love means for your goodness because you're kind. And despite all of his anguish, his grief, and his pain, David never let go of this powerful reality that God loved him and that God was good. And oftentimes when we experience pain and suffering, the very thing we question is what? God's love. I cannot tell you how many times I've had people come and say, look, I'm going through this, and how could a loving God let me go through this? And I'm not saying that there's some level in understanding that response, but I'll tell you, if you dwell on that response very long, your faith will begin to topple. And for David, he recognized this, that despite his pain and suffering, God never changed. And so his perspective of God could not be determined by the circumstances that he was in. And that's what my prayer to you right now is, no matter what your circumstances are right now, and I can't say that I can step in your shoes and to feel your pain, but I can tell you this, God has not changed right now. He still loves you steadfastly. It's a powerful reminder that, like David, we cannot allow the situations in our lives to alter our view of who God truly is. And I want you to, this is a point that I wanted to make sure I point out. The main Motivation for David going to God in prayer over his distress was his understanding of God's character. You get that? David understood the character of his father, and he knew that in this pain, in this suffering, even if I brought it on myself, I knew who my father is. And David knew without a shadow of a doubt that God was merciful and that God loved him. And I'm going to say something right now. This is one of the greatest tragedies that we've lost in the church. That somehow we can step outside of God's grace and mercy as His children. And I see a lot of fathers out there, and I'll say mothers as well. And there's been things that our children may have done that have broken our heart, right? But despite that brokenness, we still love our children unconditionally. And how much more? And if you don't believe me, I know I always say, what's behind me? That is the central figure of our faith, is that cross. A reminder every day that no matter what I do... God is ready to extend mercy and love towards me. 
Powerful truth that I hope you guys grasp because it was a reminder to me, God, I know I'm going to make mistakes. I know I'm not going to live up to your expectations, but I know every day when I cry out to you, I go to a merciful and loving God. The last part of this deliverance that David wants to seek is he wants to have the continual opportunity to praise God. That's one thing I love about David. He just loved to praise God. This is what it says in verse 5. He says this, For in death there is no remembrance of you, in Sheol, which is just a term for the realm of the dead, who will give you praise? What David is just being honest about, he's not making a theological statement about the afterlife. It's not his point here. His point is more of a recognition that if he dies, he can no longer praise God in this life. That's right. And that's what he desired. That was his whole focus. And in the, in the reality really is, from our perspective, we have a greater picture of the afterlife, don't we? David didn't. For us right now, if you've called upon the name of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'll tell you one truth. And it was the same truth that I said to that gentleman who called me and said, my dad is not here. I said, in the midst of your pain, you can rejoice because one thing we know very clear, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's the truth for all of us, which David didn't fully grasp. But there's one thing that David reminds us very clear, and this was his mindset, that one of the main reasons that we live here is to bring praise to God. And that's so easy when things are going well, right? Thank you, Lord, you blessed me today. Thank you that uh, this relationship is working out. Thank you, God, that you know, I got this extra bonus in my paycheck I wasn't expecting. But where's David at when he's doing this? He is a broken man in the midst of extreme distress, grief, and pain. But yet he says, God, despite this, one of my desires is to continually praise you. What a powerful one. That's why I said, you know, you can't grasp David without understanding his relationship to God prior to the situation. His whole heart, his whole desire was to serve God, so that's why he could walk through this. And so after David does that, he goes to verse 6 and 7. Now it's this desperate cry for help. He understands God's mercy. He's seeking restoration. Now he says, God, I'm just going to lay it out. And so this is what he says in verse 6 and 7. I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. In other words, what David is expressing in this situation that he says, God, right now, I am left mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually exhausted. And so he uses these poetic words, because once again, you know, the Psalms is poetic language. So he's using these poetic words to try to describe how his pain feels. He says, I've experienced sleepless nights. He goes, I'm experiencing depression, discouragement, and I'm feeling the defeat, the defeat of, of my own enemies over me. That's how, you ever felt that way before? How many of you guys have had a sleepless night over something in your life? How many of you faced discouragement? You felt depressed? You felt that the people around you are mocking you and looking and taking almost joy in the fact that you're struggling? That's David. And David's act, I want you to understand, of bearing his heart before the Lord is an acceptable approach to a loving father. Somehow we have lost this idea that we have to go to God very rigid and we have to have this mechanical prayer. But yet David reminds us that I can go to my father and I can pour out the greatest, deepest pain in my life and I know that he will hear me. David had a proper recognition of this, that God truly cared about him in his situation. And I don't know why we've got this idea that somehow God does not sympathize with us in our pain. Because I hear it all the time. God does not understand. If he did, he would change the situation. But you know what? This is what the author of Hebrews says. He says this, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. What does that mean? That means that while we may feel God has it, but more powerful than that, which is a very important theological truth, God says I can sympathize with it because I understand that. I've been challenged like that. And look at the life of Jesus. He experienced betrayal. He experienced rejection. All the things that we go through in life, and what do we have? We can go to him because he sympathizes with our pain, with our grief, with our struggles. What a great promise. And as we go to the last part of this, it is now, and this is a powerful shift in David's psalm, because now he's going to go to a declaration of God's response. This is what it says in verse 8 and 10. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. 
Do you see the radical change in David's tone of his voice? He went from lamenting, which means he's crying out to God, to what now? He is declaring strength and confidence. A complete change in his perspective. Did it happen overnight? I don't know. It could have been a process of time. But yet David's walking us through what we have to do in our own pain and our own grief. Because here's the key. Many people remain in a state of defeat rather than victory. It happens all the time. We allow our pain and our grief to never let us move forward. Now look it. Look at David's life. Was there grief always in his life? Was there pain? Yeah. That's part of human nature. I can't promise you that you'll walk out of here and not have a pain-free life. In fact, some of us experience more pain than others. And we seem to have more pain than we have good days. But I'll tell you this. God, like in David's life, is saying, I want to walk you to a point where you're no longer walking in defeat, but you're walking in victory in me. And so how does David do this? Well, the first thing he says is he says, depart from me, all you workers of evil. Now, what does David mean by that? Well, it seems to be the case that perhaps, I use the word perhaps, right? The situation of David is he has allowed himself to be associated with evil men who have caused this problem. And we learn about that. The way of the wicked, what do they do? They, they walk, they stand in the ways of the, of, of the, of the unrighteous. And so this could be a part of David saying, God, I, I want them out of my life. Now, do you hear this? Because what can be very easy, if you're sitting there trying to affirm this message for your life, you can say, well, God loves me, so I can just do whatever I want. No, no, no. Because if that's what David's point is, what is David saying? To seek restoration, to seek deliverance, and to know that I'm confident you will respond, I've got to change what has brought me here. So get away from me, you evil workers. Get away from me. Stop influencing you. Stop dragging me down because I'm going to walk in victory with Christ. So I'll just simply say this one point. Whatever situation that you're in right now, maybe God is saying, you want victory? Then change what's going on and get it out because it's holding you back. The power of restoration involves that process of repentance. Then restoration occurs. And that's what we see in the life of David. Victory comes when we let go of what's holding us back or defeating us. So besides saying, get, depart from me, you workers of evil, David then acknowledges that God is going to accept his prayer. What is David's words? He goes, God, you have heard the sound of my weeping. You've heard the sound of my plea. You accept my prayers. And here it is. David, with great confidence, exclaims in faith that God has heard his cries. Now here's the radical part of David's cry, uh, confidence. It is an expression not of what God has done, but what God will do. Do you understand that? David is foreshadowing what God's going to do. He is confidently asserting, I've taken these steps, and now I know that my God is going to respond. And you have to have that confidence in God to say, God, I know we're not there yet, but I am stuck walking by faith that you will respond. David's confidence, I want you to understand, rests not in his desperate cry. I'm not saying because you cry out to God, everything's going to just work out. But why did David have confidence? If it wasn't in his cry, why did David have confidence? Because he had confidence in the one whom he cried out to. Do you get the point? You ever try to go to a situation and someone say, can you fix the problem? And you realize, hey, I can't help you. You need to go talk to somebody else, right? David recognized the very one that could fix my problem was God. And so to him is the one I have confidence in. What a powerful reminder. I love what David says. This is Psalm 9, 9 and 10. And maybe you guys need to claim this passage for your life and your situation right now. David says the following, The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. What a great promise. And the last part here, before we go to the closing, as David is confident in God's um, you know, response to him, he says this thing. He goes, now it's going to be trouble for my enemies. So what does David mean? I mean, he's rejoicing over his enemies being in trouble. Well, I think this is what David is trying to point out, that he knew that when God heard and answered his prayer, it'd be trouble for his enemies. Now, why would David say that? Because it appears that there are people in David's life, enemies, who are looking at David and saying, you're a failure. Look what you have done. There's no way God would forgive you. There's no way God can use you. And how many times have you heard that voice? I would say one of the greatest reasons why right now you're not doing what God has called you to do because you're still living in the past. 
And the enemy's coming in and he's saying, look at this. I'm going to pour some guilt into you. I'm going to pour some shame into you. I'm going to remind you. I'm going to play in your mind right now every little failure that you've done before God and just to let you know you can never be used by him. And David right here is saying, guess what? I am setting myself free and God, is, as they have brought trouble into my life, God will now bring trouble into their life. You must right now walk in victory to know that the cross has conquered the enemy in your life right now. Don't let the enemy beat you down with guilt and shame. It is time to walk in the same victory that David understood. Because once again, we don't know the exact details, but it's once again fair to conclude these enemies are coming in to remind him of his failure, and David said that God will come in and bring trouble to them. What a powerful transition from a man who was broken, crying out to God, to where he comes to a confident recognition that because of who God is, God will respond. Now I told you this was a tra- this was a a challenging passage. You want to know why it's challenging? Because when you're day three working on your sermon, you're like, this is not going the way I want. I've got to change the whole thing. You know it's challenging. But there are three things in this passage that really I want to share with you that I think God has really laid on my heart. And hopefully it'll transform, once again, how you see God and how you choose to walk with Him. But the first thing is this. We have got to call upon the Lord. We have got to be like David and go directly to God with our burdens, our grief, and our pain. And as I said before, we can't let the enemy bring doubt, guilt, and shame to prevent us from doing this. And while it's fine for you to seek out pastors, to seek out other believers, and I encourage that because that's part of the body of Christ, to edify, to encourage, but before you do that, go to God. Get on your knees and cry out to Him. Because one of the things that I feel is wrong with our culture, and the church somehow is bought into this lie, we feel that when we're going through pain, we can find relief in food. We can find relief on watching television. We can find relief in our relationships. But I'm going to tell you something. All that does when we go to something else besides God, all that will do for you right now, listen to me very clearly, is all it's going to do is numb your pain. You must go to the one who can heal your pain. And so my first challenge is to call upon the Lord and get on your knees and cry out to Him. And that's the second one, cry out to the Lord. Isn't it hard to be vulnerable in front of someone? I mean, even in front of your own spouse, in front of your own children, it's so hard to be vulnerable, to say, here's my weaknesses, here's my brokenness. And for somehow, because we have a struggle in this life to do that, we struggle that in our relationship with God, don't we? How can I really pour my heart out? But I think we've lost this great art, the art of pouring out our heart before God and expressing to Him our pain. Because sometimes we need to express our pain with tears before God. We need to pour out our heart to Him in weeping. When's the last time you truly weep before the Lord? Because I don't know about you guys, but just as tears of a child go to the very heart of a father, so too our tears go to the very heart of our Heavenly Father. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, It is so sweet to know that our tears are understood even when words fail. Let us learn to think of tears as liquid prayers, which will surely wear its way right into the very heart of God's mercy. Don't lose sight of the art of crying out to the Lord in your pain. And the last thing I'll share is we've got to be confident in who God is. You must reclaim for your life right now that you serve a merciful and gracious God. So no matter what pain you have, no matter what failure you come, no matter how much you feel like you've let God down, God is saying, I'm just waiting for you to come back home. Come experience my mercy and grace. Remember, it doesn't remove his discipline. It doesn't remove some of the consequences of life. But God is saying, come to me. I'm a merciful and loving God. Remember, God is steadfast in love always. No matter what you do, it will never separate you from his love. And remember that God hears the cries of his children. That God is not deaf to your pain, but he desires for you to come to him and pour it out before him. I hope and pray this passage of David has been challenging and encouraging to you. Because I look out there, and I know many of you guys, through this time that we'll be together and serve the Lord through truth and grace, we're going to have some great moments of rejoicing and victory, aren't we? But I know that we're going to walk through some moments of pain, some moments of tragedy. And all I can tell you, when those moments come, while I know we'll be there for each other, let us not lose sight that we can go to our Heavenly Father and cry out to Him and find strength in ways that we can find nowhere else. Let's pray.